Oh, now where is Nicole? You know, these days, whenever I can't find Nicole, she's always out with her head in the flowers out here in the meadow. There you are. Hey. What's going on? Nothing. It's time we got to go tell everybody about our new video. Oh, no. But I was right in the middle of looking for creatures in the garden. Did you find anything interesting? There are some cool caterpillars and butterflies. Awesome. Yeah. We're back. Hello. <laughs> Sorry we've been away for a while. So today, for today's video, we want to share with you one of our uh, Zoom presentations. We've been doing a lot of these during COVID. And uh, this was a complete retooling of my very popular building an image series, which has something for all photographers. Whether you're a beginner photographer, you've been doing it for decades, there's something you're going to pull away from this program. We did this for, what camera club was it? This was for the Los Gatos Camera Club in California. That's right. Yeah, it was, it was a it, lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. They were a good group, um, a big group. It was a big bunch of people. So we started taking questions in the middle of it, and then we thought, you know what? It was going to go long because there were so many people. So we saved all the questions to the end. But stay to the end. This group had a bunch of great questions that are going to apply to everybody's photography. There's a lot of good information. So thanks for stopping by. Hope you enjoy. Have fun. I am Steve Gettle, and this lovely vision is my sweet Nicole. We are professional nature photographers. We're from Michigan. Um, it's actually bedtime here. It is. It's so if, if Nicole starts falling asleep <laughs> in the other room, you'll understand what's going on. Yeah. She's seen these seminars a few times. So actually, though, tonight, you guys are going to be, I just, this is, you guys are going to see our most popular uh, program called uh building an image let me get my ducks in a row here how come i can't get to that that's gonna be an issue what are you trying to get to to get to the slideshow part of it i can't see it because i can't oh there we go sorry um so and you're going to see i've completely redone it and you guys are the maiden voyage so but steve practice I did practice. Don't tell them that. <laughs> I'm a highly paid professional. It just happens. Um, so we are, I don't know. I, I didn't actually get a chance to ask Jeffrey, but we're in webinar format. So I'm not sure if you guys have done this before. For those of you who have not, um, you can see us, but we can't see you. Um, but we'd love for these things to be interactive. Nicole and I have been doing these for the last three or four months. We've done a couple hundred of them. And, uh, so Nicole's actually, well, she hasn't seen the new version yet, so it'll be kind of new for this her, but um, we like to make it give and take. So please, we totally encourage you guys to ask questions. Once we get rolling, Nicole's going to get go into the other room and she will screen all of those questions for us. Um, so if you're new to Zoom, if you hold your mouse over the top or the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little toolbox come up. There's a question and answer box. If you use a Q&A, Nicole will be watching that please ask questions just if nothing else just to keep this poor girl awake oh, yeah. <laughs> um fine. so we are nature photographers we're from michigan we actually were lucky enough we make our living as nature photographers we leave workshops and tours all over the world Ta -da. <laughs> and uh, i have an agent who sells things to books magazines and calendars so i've been doing it for about 30 years uh nicole's been doing it for about 20 um and as Jeffrey so so uh, wonderfully put it, we do like to photograph everything. We do yeah. birds, we do mammals, we do macro, we do landscapes. It's all nature related. Um, if we can find ourselves outdoors, we can usually find something to take a picture of. Something you should know about my about both of our photography, really. I came up in the days of slide film, and that's how I started shooting. I love shooting slides, and I love photographing digital. But something that's a little different than a lot of people, I actually shoot digital like I shot film. I like to do things in the camera, not a big Photoshop guy, um, mainly because we shoot so much, it's hard for us to, to really make love to each of our images. Because if I keep it, I'm going to send it to my agent, which means I have to process it. So um, 
literally our post processing is I move a couple sliders around for for 20 or 30 seconds and I move on to the next image. So um, that's a little different. But uh, and we try to do things in camera, don't crop a lot, things like that. Um, Notes. notes we will send out a full set of notes to everybody uh we're probably not going to do it right after the program we'll probably do it tomorrow morning um but we will get a full set of notes so you don't have to worry about scribbling things down um nicole is going to go in the other room now i'm all on my own um so uh one of the other things that we do is we teach an all day nature photography seminar and all of those programs that Jeffrey was talking about are programs that make up that seminar. And tonight you guys are going to see uh, the uh, brand new edition of, oops, what am I doing here? There we go of building an image. This is uh, this is a program I've had for probably five or six years, but I completely redid it, updated it with new images and new thoughts. And uh, you guys are the maiden voyage. So. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, very good. Just wanted to check. Okay. Um, so building an image. This is all about composition and how I put together an image. And when I was building the rest of the seminar, it was kind of surprising. Everything else went together pretty easy. You know, I mean, equipment is what it is, how to do birds, how to do mammals. Those things are just, you know, it, it follows a, a progression and, and it was pretty easy to put together those classes. But when I came around to thinking about composition and how I make a picture, it was, it was, I've been doing it for a long time and I don't necessarily think about it. So building this program was really a great exercise for me because it forced me to kind of stop and think about how I did things, how I actually put together an image. And it is a building process. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how I build an image. So technical things aside, you know, composing a picture, something like this, this is pretty easy, right? Fill the frame, you know, clean up to make sure the background's nice and clean. <clears throat> you know, I usually pay attention to the background, but make sure it's sharp, make sure I got enough depth of field and take the picture. There's not a lot of composition that goes into this, right? When you get into images more like this, now we've got to start thinking about how we're going to put the pieces and parts together. Now we got to consider the background. Now we've got to, you know, this takes a little more artistry, a little more thought to build a picture when we, when we do things like this. And as our pictures <clears throat> get more complicated, more thought and things like that go into uh, making the picture and how we're going to put all the pieces and parts together. So, um, this is a truism. Very rarely do my pictures just happen. Um, I, I watched a program by a guy, Marcel Van Oosten, uh, uh, I think he's from the Netherlands, a really great photographer. And he was he spoke to something that he called reactive photography versus proactive photography. And I thought, boy, that really nails it really well. And that's what I do. There's reactive photography, which is we just react to the situation. We see what's in front of us. We, we frame it up and take the picture. And then there's more proactive photography. And we all do both, but I do a lot more proactive photography. I put a lot more thought into my photography, how I'm going to put things together, how I'm going to manage the background, how I'm going to manage the depth of field and, and all of those different challenges. And when I thought about how I'm going to teach this, um, what I came up with is that it's actually a group of decisions, a, a group of conscious decisions that I make as I, <clears throat> as I approach a scene. So that's what I'm going to talk about today are the decisions that I make as I'm putting together a picture. All right, do we, have, do we have any questions before I get going, Nicole? All right, keep her busy. And if, if it's even if you just want to know how I made a particular picture or anything like that, don't be shy about questions. There's not going to be any wrong questions here, obviously. All right. So we're making decisions. So the very first decision we need to make is 
we're walking down a trail, we're walking down the street, something caught our eye. All right. So that's the first decision we need to make. What is it that we want to make a picture of? What, what's grabbed our attention? And more importantly for me is what do we want to communicate about that subject? Because that's the most, for me, that's my goal as a photographer. Is I want to communicate something to the viewer. And if you think about it, photography is a super powerful tool to communicate. Um, it crosses all barriers. It crosses age barriers, language barriers, um, race, or, uh, uh, societal barriers. Think about all the powerful images you've seen throughout your life that have made big changes in the world, journalistic photographs, the, the photographs that started the environmental movement. Photography is a super powerful tool. So that's what I'm always thinking about. What is it that I want to communicate? And it can be anything. Right? Something simple as look how pretty this is. Or look at how interesting this is. Move in close and show people something they haven't seen before. Get into all the detail of that beautiful dew covered damsel fly. <clears throat> but always trying to communicate something. Nicole and I do a, a tour to the Angangueo Mountains to do the monarch uh, migration in, in Mexico. And every few years they get a, a storm, we have a big die off of the monarchs. And that's what this is, this photograph is showing. Silhouettes distill things down just to their shape. Of course, a great blue heron. Photography's all about the light. Magic light is this fox all backlit, stalking his little brother. And color is a super powerful tool in photography. This is not done with photoshop this is straight right straight out of the camera just like this um what's going on here this dramatic color is caused by sunlit foliage on the other side of the pond that's reflected in the shaded part of this pond so it's sunlit reflection in the shaded part of the pond really fun to play with i call that a light reflection all right we're always looking for that decisive moment Right, whatever you want to communicate something from something is, is save the world kind of images to something as simple as look how pretty this is. Nicole, you're perking up. Do you have a question? We do have um, a couple questions. Um, we forgot to mention that the questions are better if they go in the Q&A box rather than the chat, because sometimes I miss them in the chat. Um, but so in the future, the question and answer box is better. Um, but first question uh, from Richard, what is your um, equip equipment and favorite lenses? So uh, Nicole and I are both Nikon people. Um, we shoot, uh, I've been shooting Nikon for probably 25 years. Uh, and we're shooting with D5s, D4Ss, D500s. Um, and being that we do everything, we have tons of gear, right? Because we, we have wide angles for doing landscapes. We have giant 600 millimeters for doing birds, macro lenses, and everything in between. Uh, do a lot of work with zoom lenses these days. Um, you know, basically my kid is a 17 to 35, a 24 to 85, a 70 to 210, a 200 to 400, a 600, and a couple macro lenses and some other weird little lenses. But so we've got a lot of that covered with zoom lenses, which works out really well. Uh, they're a lot better than they used to be. Um, Keith is asking regarding color, please comment on how you set your white balance. Um, I, I shoot Nikon and, and Nikon's auto white balance has been really good. Being that we shoot raw, we can always fine tune that in our post processing if we want a little warmer or a little cooler. Uh, but I find the auto white balance works really well for me and I, I set it on auto and I, I never, never change it. Um, 
we have an anonymous attendee who's asking, do you shoot mostly manual aperture priority um, or something else for wildlife shots? So it depends on the situation. So being that I used to shoot slide film, I shot everything on manual, right? Because back then we didn't have the histogram. We didn't have the ability to check to make sure the exposure was right. And if you were shooting slide film, if you were off a third of a stop, it was a Frisbee. It, it was garbage. It didn't work anymore. So because we didn't have sliders to fix things like that. So I was really good at shooting manual. Whenever I shoot manual, I shot spot metering. Okay. Now, since the advent of digital photography, now we've got the histogram. So now I can check to see what the camera's doing, make sure the camera's properly placing the tones. So that's freed me up to shoot aperture priority and uh, matrix metering. And then I use exposure compensation to fine tune uh, my exposure. And that's what we shoot probably 75 or 80% of the time. But Manual is a super important tool that we use a lot. The reason I shoot aperture priority more often is because for 90% of the, of the times it works great and I don't have to do exposure compensation. I, it just works. And if the light's coming in and out of the clouds, I don't have to re-meter every time. It's just faster. And I know when I need to, to dial in exposure compensation. But the reason I kick back to manual sometimes is for instance, we just got back from our Yellowstone and winter program or tour and you're shooting in snowy situations and it's it's a lot easier to shoot a manual. I use manual for flight shots. I, we use manual for silhouettes. So there are certain times that we still use manual. And when we use manual, we use spot meter because then we can precisely get a meter reading, set our exposure and and be all set if you know if we've got a coyote in the middle of a field of snow i can take a spot meter reading right off that coyote set my exposure and i'm good to go yeah um and then christopher's asking do you use shutter priority for birds in flight i don't and that's a great question and i can tell you're a thinking photographer that is a great question because your shutter speed your priority when you're photographing birds in flight right so why not shoot shutter priority the reason is because I just don't. I shoot aperture priority and I'm watching my shutter speed, but I'm controlling it through my aperture, right? And I'm, when we get to the exposure part of things, I'm going to explain kind of my process on that. But you're right. My shutter is my priority and I'm, I'm still watching the shutter speed, but I'm controlling it through my aperture. If I need a faster shutter speed, I open up. If I'm shooting, if I'm wasting shutter speed, I'll stop down some more. Yeah. Um... So we are getting quite a few questions and we had one comment. Do you think we could hold the questions and let you get on with the presentation? Um, Cause we're 20 minutes in and you haven't really gotten going yet. So do you want to do that or take a few? I, I'm, you know what, if something's prescient, prescient, okay. did I just use that in a sentence? You did. Feel free to interrupt me. That's typically the way we do it. But yeah, this is going to go along if we keep asking questions so uh, yeah. many so fast. So, and we are a bigger group, so. Yeah. All righty. And this was quite possibly the most boring slide to be stuck on. <laughs> All right. So the next decision, we're still making decisions. So let's decide what to include in the frame, right? What, how we're going to frame it up, what our message is going to be, and what we want to keep in the frame to tell that message. And for me, more importantly, it's about what to exclude because kind of my style is clean, simple, hopefully elegant images. I want to, I'm generally, when I'm framing up a shot, I'm trying to get rid of visual distractions. I'm trying to get rid of clutter. I'm trying to control the background. So for me, oftentimes I'm trying to get rid of things in the frame. Okay. So here's a picture of a little screech owl nestled into a, uh, into a tree trunk. I loved what attracted me to this was how well camouflaged he is in that tree trunk. And that for me is the story of this picture, all right? Now, I don't think I very effectively communicated this, right? He's kind of, he's you know, there's a bunch of negative space off on the left. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's a lot of other places for your eye to go than where I want the message to be, right? So typically I want to distill the picture down to just my message. Now, that being said, I have an agent who sells things to books, magazines, and calendars. He loves pictures like this because editors like pictures like this because they can crop them, they can drop their text in, they've got some room to play. But for a standalone, pretty picture, kind of calendar or camera club type image, 
this is going to be much more effectively communicate my message of look how well camouflaged this bird is, right? There's no other distractions. It's all right there. So that's kind of my style. Now, we don't always want to stuff things in the frame, right? When we've got a beautiful situation like me, for this, for this particular picture, the screech owl to me is secondary. The story of this picture is look at this beautiful sycamore tree this guy chose to nest in, right? That for me is the story. So we want to back off and show some of that, right? Just to, to zoom in and fill the frame with this owl would, would not be as beautiful a picture, I don't think. All right now, when we have a subject like this hooded merganser, right? There's nothing else going on in this frame, right? And I, I think when you look at this picture, you'll you'll find your eyes being drawn off into the corners because you're kind of looking around, going, "What else is there? There's got to be something else in here." Now, if your story is solitude, well, this maybe effect effectively communicates that, but I'd make some different compositional choices. I'd get them out of the bullseye, but for the most part. I'm going to work to get in closer. This is probably a picture I took when I was, when I was getting into this, you know, one of those uh, insurance shots, right? But typically, I'm going to try to fill the frame more. Now, don't feel like you got to wedge everything in the, in, the, uh, in the frame. You know, with, with digital, we have the ability to crop after that fact. And a lot of people crop things within an inch of their lives. Um, now, I probably moved in and did more of a full frame picture of this bird, but for this picture, I, I left the reflection. There's implied movement from our right to the left. I gave some, some room for that, that bird to swim into it. Right, so I don't feel like you gotta jam everything in the frame, especially living, breathing subjects like this. Okay, backgrounds. Backgrounds are probably one of the things that I'm always working on. For a lot of people, backgrounds are just afterthoughts. But if we're doing, which we're doing a lot, just portraits of birds and animals, a lot of times there's more background in the picture than there is actual subject. So backgrounds are super important. I'm always working on them, okay? This is my ideal background. I want a nice out of focus, blurry background that just sets off the subject, pops them off the screen, gives it that depth, all right? Now I'm always asked, how do I get backgrounds like this? Is this a piece of mat board? Is this something I do in Photoshop? The answer is no, this is absolutely how, in fact, this was a slide. So um, this is exactly how it was through the camera. What I'm looking for, I'm looking for a situation that when I focus on the bird, the background is far enough away that it just becomes an out of focus blur. Okay. And it's a situation that I strive for and I look for all the time. In fact, a lot of times I won't even take a picture if I can't get a decent background. All right. So if I've got a flock of cedar waxwings and they're feeding in an ash tree, I'm not going to work on the birds in the middle of the tree, right? Because behind them is going to be a messy background. I'm going to look up for the birds hanging off the sides of the tree where I can line up the bird with a distant background and get a nice out of focus background like this. Okay. Here's a, a bird from Costa Rica. This is a collared red start. And he landed on this beautiful perch. I was really excited. I did what I always did. I, I grabbed that first shot, right? Always get the shot because you don't know how long the bird's going to be there. But when I take pictures, I make the first picture and then I go, I look at it and I say, okay, what can I do to make this better? Can I improve this? Can I change the background? Can I wait for better light? What can I do? And I immediately notice these, these hot spots up in the corner, right? Those pull your eye away from my subject, right? Your eye's drawn to the hottest, the brightest thing in the frame. So those are distracting. So I realized that I took two steps to my right and made this picture, okay? A lot cleaner, a lot less distractions, probably gonna get another point or two in a camera club, right? Just think about getting rid of visual distractions. <coughs> All right, now they don't all have to be completely out of focus. I love this picture. I love this background. I love this setting. This tells the story of where this great blue heron is. Um, the reason this background works for me is because the bird pops off of it, right? It, it's, there's beautiful color self separation. And I love that there's all that texture in the background and it's not visually distracting and it actually gives the bird a sense of place, which is what I like about it. 
right? Now, backgrounds are have a lot of impact on your subject. This is, uh, Nicole and I do a, a workshop at a, a Raptor Rehabilitation Center, and this is one of their, their, their birds. He's a trained, he's kind of an animal model, I guess. He can't be released, but he's an educational bird, and they allow us to photograph, and we do, it's a fundraiser for them. But uh, these pictures were all made within about five minutes of each other with a 400 millimeter lens, and all I did was move from right to left and photograph this bird in front of a different background. The first, the one on the left is just tree trunks with a little bit of oak leaves in the back. The one in the middle is a, is a meadow of grass. And then the one on the right is uh, some fall color that was behind him. And look at how they change. The one on the left, look at how this darker background brings out all these dark tones. Whereas this one, see how all the oranges pop out? So they completely change the look of the picture and make a big change. So oftentimes, that's one of the things I'll do. I'll make a, make a picture and then look to see if I can get in a different position and get a different background. Anything pressing, baby? Okay. All right. So we're still making decisions. So the next decision is, are we going to handle our, our subject in a vertical or a horizontal? All right, and usually our subject's gonna dictate that, right? This picture with this monarch butterfly, nice dew-covered monarch on, uh, on a piece of clover. You know, if we tried to make this a vertical, there'd be a lot of dead space in it. It just wouldn't work out compositionally. Okay, the same is true for this, right? Can't imagine doing this as a horizontal. It just works better as a vertical. All the lines, everything <clears throat> says it wants to be a vertical. Here's a uh, stand of bunchberry. I don't know if that's a stand or would that be a field, a meadow? A whole bunch of bunchberry um, with a beautiful fern coming up through it. Works really well as a horizontal, but it also works quite well as a vertical, right? When you can, do both, right? If you sell prints, the print over a couch, over a, over a sofa is always a horizontal. The print over the fireplace is usually vertical. If you sell editorial, the, uh, the cover is usually a vertical. A two-page spread is a horizontal. So when you can, when it works out, do it both ways. It'll give you more options with the picture. All right, so let's talk about building a picture. So Let's talk about the rules of composition. And this woman was actually my teacher, sister. I won't say her whole name, but she was, I remember her. This makes me a little scared when I see it. All right. So there are no rules of composition. See, this was my first grade teacher. She was a lot more pleasant, right? There are no rules. This is your art. This is your work. But there are some guidelines, some things that tend to be true more often than not. All right, so the next decision we're gonna make is how to organize the elements in your, in your image. All right, the first and most simple and basic rule of composition that works very, very well and is a standard fallback of mine is the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds simply says that if you divide the 35 millimeter frame into thirds on the vertical and the horizontal, where those lines intersect, you'd like to place your center of interest at or near one of those intersections. And this just works. I just, I do it basically instinctively. It just happens because it's just the way my eye works now. So let's look at some examples. Here's a three-toed sloth, okay? Whenever we're looking at a living, breathing subject, the first thing we're gonna lock on to usually is the eyes, right? So when we put those eyes at or near one of those PowerPoints compositionally, it just works very well. Okay, an eyelash viper from Costa Rica, All right? Same thing, at or near. Now, don't, you know, don't feel like you gotta get the head right exactly at that intersection. Get it in the ballpark and it work. It's gonna work. You don't wanna force a composition. You don't wanna crop off the top of that, that flower to, uh, to make it hit exactly in that point. Get it in the ballpark, okay? We're gonna lock onto the eyes. The brightest thing in the frame is usually gonna, gonna pull, pull the viewer's eye. Again, using the PowerPoint. I use this a lot in pattern shots. Just simple drying mud, 
right? Our eyes tend to just wander through there, having what I call a, a, a an island, a little sanctuary island, a little place to take a break from the pattern. Again, using the pat, using the uh, the PowerPoint to put that beautiful buckeye butterfly right there. And if you're really good, you can hit it with two things. That's advanced though. These, of course, are strawberry dart frogs from Costa Rica. So I'm always thinking of how the viewer's eye is going to move through my pictures, right? The more we can pull their eye where we want it to go, the more we can contain their eye within the frame, the more visually interesting and the more exciting the picture is going to be for them. All right, so <clears throat> no matter where you come into this picture, there are lines to pull your eye where I want it to go, right up to the, the center of this flower and this beautiful spider. All right, so here's another light reflection. We talked about those earlier. This is out in Utah. This beautiful molten gold water is actually a reflection off to camera left is a red rock wall that's being lit by morning's first rays. So it's got beautiful warm light on this beautiful warm wall. And that sunlit wall is reflected in this shaded part of this stream. Okay, so this is a visual line, right? This is a leading line. You just, you can't help, you just take a nice little gradual walk, jaunt up this beautiful golden water. Now, where does that line take you? Well, it takes you out of the frame, right? Which is less than ideal, right? Typically we'd want, like in that last picture, we want those lines to take you to the center of interest of the picture. This is kind of a unique picture in that, that golden water is the point of the picture that's you know i'm not going to find anything to compete with it so i just decided to embrace it but in a perfect world all of those lines would take us up to the point of the picture like this beautiful butte here okay now this is a good start but i don't think i've really embraced these beautiful leading lines very well all right i haven't made made them as impactful as they could in addition to that there's a lot of dead space off on the right side that doesn't really add anything to the picture. Look what happens when we really use these to their best effect. Okay, now I've gotten weight right down low, gotten rid of all that dead area off on the right. I'm probably eight or 10 inches off the ground here. The very wide lens, probably a 17 millimeter, lots of depth of field. You can't help but jump on these on these leading lines and pull you up to that butte. Nicole, do you have anything? Or are you? I think we can hold these until the end. Okay, good. All yeah. right. Will you just interrupt me and I'll stop stopping? I will. Yeah. All right. Just interrupt me. Okay. <clears throat> All righty. So remember earlier, I said the first thing the viewer is going to look at is your subject's eye. If it's a living, breathing, an animal, a bird, an insect, first thing they're going to look at is their eye. The next thing they're going to do is they're going to follow their gaze. They're going to follow those sight lines, right? Where does this chickadee's eye is sight take you? Well, it takes you right out of the frame, right? Now, this is a pretty cool picture. I'm certainly not going to throw this away because of that, but I also realize this one is stronger right? Because now you lock onto his eye, you follow his gaze down, it takes you right down the line of this, nothing to see here, you come down here, you go back up here, right? I pulled your eye all the way through the whole picture, right? Kept it within the frame, stronger picture for me. All right, handling motion with the frame, within the frame, pretty simple, pretty basic, for the most part, I often want to give some some room for that motion to, to happen, right? We all know what's happening here. These grebes are rushing across the water. Give them some space to rush into. Now, we can also handle it where we put the grebes closer to the edge of the frame and celebrate the water coming up behind them. Gives it a little visual tension. Again, there are no absolute rules. But for the most part, I usually like to give some the animals some room to go into right this this jaguar is getting right is actually in the process of leaping onto a capy or um a caiman down in brazil i mean i love those talons out 
Okay, another compositional guideline. All right, this is why. I call this a ping pong picture, right? Because all you do is you make a straight line back and forth between these two things. Straight line, all right, um, like you're watching a ping pong game, right? And the reason is we, they're, we have an established visual dominance, right? They're both the same size. They're both the same shape. They're both the same sharpness. Um, they're both the same color density. You know, the one on the right is a little bit taller, but that's not really enough to carry the picture. So we just kind of go back and forth, making a straight line back and forth through the picture. Look what happens when we add a third element. Okay, now we've got a lot more visual paths to make to go through this picture, right? We can, you know, compare the two to each other and just bounce around and, and make different visual paths. It's, it's a lot more dynamic than just making a straight line back and forth. Okay, but remember, there's no guide, there's no rules, only guidelines. Here's another, here's a different subject where we've got two, two objects again, and we're still making a straight line back and forth between the one in the front and the one in the back, right? But through the use of visual dominance, we've, we've shown that the one in the front to be the point of the picture. He's more important. He's closer. He's sharper. And therefore, we spend more time on him. The other one becomes a, uh, a secondary object to that main object in the picture. So I think for me, this works, right? Similar situation here with these two cheetah, two cheetah brothers, right? Kind of a similar situation, but again, we've established visual dominance with the one on the left because he's, he's sharper. So we end up knowing, we just in, instinctively know that that's the point of the picture. The other one is an interesting comparison to the, to the first. All right, composition 101, here's why. Boring, right? I mean, it's, it's chip monkeys doing something interesting. The light's decent, the background's nice, but compositionally, this is just boring. There, there's, there's just nothing to it. You put no thought into it at all, all right? But this works because it's bullseye. This is actually a snowflake. And uh, this is, by bullseyeing it, this is a celebration of symmetry. And by bullseyeing it, we've called attention to and celebrated that symmetry. Okay, once again, this I think is more powerful because this face is right dead in the center of the frame, right? It's making contact, it's pulled the, the viewer in and, and acknowledging your existence. And it's, it's powerful because of that symmetry. The reason for this, I think, is that this is a, uh, a little moth on a banana leaf in, uh, I think, Ecuador. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the main lines of this picture, the lines of its leading edge of his wings, <clears throat> run parallel to the edges of the frame. Okay, which this, it's an okay picture. I mean, there's nothing really wrong with it. But this, for me, is stronger right? And it's because it doesn't run parallel to the edges of the frame. It makes it more dynamic. All right, beautiful diagonal lines to pull the viewer's eye up to the focal point of the picture, this beautiful trogan, right? Um, okay, photographs my photographs are always developing as I'm shooting them. I'm always, I take the first picture, like that, that collared red start. I get the, get the grab shot, right? Then I, I say, okay, what can I do to make it different? What can I do to make it better? And it's, it's, a, it's a process of whittling it down till you find the best picture. And this is a good example of that. When I first, the first time I took this picture, I had green jungle behind it, right? And when there was green jungle behind it, you lose all the drama of these beautiful green leaves, these beautiful green diagonal lines pulling your eye up. And I looked and I could take a couple steps to my left and line up a shaded part of the jungle behind these leaves, which really made them sing and, and be more prominent in the picture, right? So always get the grab shot first, 
then continue to work the subject and, and, and improve it where you can. All right, so we're still making decisions. So the next decision we need to make is how to use the light, right? And there's a couple things I wanna talk about the light. There's the direction of the light and the quality of the light. So I'm gonna start with the direction of the light. All right, most basic lighting, <clears throat> excuse me, and the lighting that I use for probably 75, 80% of my work is front lighting, right? Nice, even, easy lighting. Right, I tell people light coming right over your shoulder, right? When you're working on it with directional front lighting, if your shadow's pointed right at your subject, your shadow subject is gonna be going behind them. So it makes it nice, even, easy. There's not a lot of contrast, not a, it's, it's very easy to expose for, and it lights things up very nicely and evenly. So it's super easy. And that is the, the, the light that we use for probably 75% of our pictures. All right, the next direction light can come from is side lighting, All right, This is drying mud out in Utah. And uh, the light is coming from our left and it's skimming over these, these ripples in the mud. And as it skims over, it creates a little highlight at the peak and then it casts a little shadow underneath each of those peaks. And that shadow, our eyes perceive that is depth. And that's always one of the challenges with photography is we're a two dimensional medium in a three dimensional world. So anything we can do to add depth to a picture is good and shadows and things like this is a good way to get that depth here. This is a, a very tight close up of a monarch butterfly wing. And those are actually individual wing scales. And the lights coming from the upper right hand corner. And is it it's very low light. So it skims over each of those wing scales and it casts a little tiny shadow under each one of those. And that shadow gives us the, the illusion of depth and makes them feel like they're popping off the screen. Right. So whenever you want to emphasize texture, side lighting is a great way to go. Okay, beautiful ermine, um, strong side lighting coming from the left. Um, this only works because it's in the snow, right? The snow is a giant reflecting box and it's just bouncing all this light. If this snow wasn't here to bounce the, the light up onto the right side of this ermine, the, the contrast would be too much range and it wouldn't really work. So having a nice low angle and all that snow makes this strong side lighting shot work really well. And it, again, it gives the feeling, the feeling of depth to the picture and adds that third dimension. All right, side lighting is super hard to expose for because you take a situation like this mute swan, we've got strong full sun coming from the left. It's low, it's early in the morning, but it's full sun on the left, shaded white on the right and a black background. This is the kind of thing that would give me fits when I was shooting slides. But now with the histogram, now we have the ability to check to make sure that the camera's recording all the highlight detail and as much of the shadow detail as we want, right? So that's the beauty of having the histogram. We can take a couple shots, double check, make sure everything's working right and uh, continue to shoot confident that we're getting all of the, all of the information that we want. All right, the last direction light can come from is backlighting. And this I think is, is probably the most fun and the most creative uh, lighting that I like to play with. Backlighting is, is light coming from behind your subject. Uh, this is a gannet from, Nicole and I do a, a workshop to Newfoundland to do puffins and gannets. This is from that. And uh, the sun's low and there's some, some sea mist in the air. Gives us this beautiful orange glow. All right, so light coming from behind your subject. This, uh, this little butterfly is actually drinking the, uh, the, the tears from the, the turtle here to get the salt from his tears. And uh, again, lights coming from behind our subjects because this beautiful makes this butterfly just light up like he's plugged in. The black background is totally natural. It's just a shaded part of the, uh, of the river that when we, when we expose for the uh, butterfly, that just naturally goes black. Okay, super uh, creative, 
light to play with. This is just simply a lizard on a leaf with the sun behind it photographing. You just meter that green leaf. The uh, lizard goes uh, completely black. Nicole, will you put a note in there that this emphasizes translucency, not texture? Thank you. Um, so again, you guys are the dry run. Um, so, but silhouette, super fun, super easy. Uh, do this with all kinds of different things. Just find a big leaf and butterflies, dragonflies, all kinds of things. Super easy and creative. Okay, again, with wildlife, this works really good. This backlighting, this would be, this would not probably work as well without the snow to, to bounce all this light around and, and throw enough light back onto this fox to, to give them enough detail. But I love the way the backlighting emphasizes all the beautiful patterns in the sculpting of the snow. And we get this beautiful rim light around the fox. Um, just works really, really well. Exposures for something like this. It's going to be an educated guess. I probably took a spot meter off the side of the fox and, and let it go and then double check my histogram to make sure I wasn't blowing out the highlights. Then, of course, silhouettes. Um, silhouettes are, uh, are all about backlighting. And this actually, this is uh, uh, was made possible because of your fires. Oh my gosh, I forgot all about that. We're in California, right? The fires in California sent smoke all the way over here. And we had like four or five days where we had this, these, this really uh, cool sunrises where it just diffused the light and allowed shots like this to be possible. So something good came out of that, at least a little bit. So that's a Viceroy on Queen Anne's Lace. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is the quality of light. All right, this is a true statement. Um, so we don't, oops, how do I do this? Oops. Oh. Um, we the light dictates what we shoot, right? If I want to go out and do birds of, in flight and it's cloudy and there's not enough light to do that, guess what? I'm going to change what I'm shooting. If I want to go out and do macro photography or jungle photography or something where um, I need soft diffuse light, I'm going to, and it's sunny, I'm going to figure out something else to shoot, right? All right. Favorite kind of light of all is high, bright, overcast, nice, soft, quiet light, you know, with, with little to no shadows, just lets all the beautiful details out, enough light to get enough depth of field. Right, when working in the jungles, this is uh, from our trip to Brazil to do the Jaguars. Um, this was This was actually, this was our first day. This was our first Jaguar on our first day last year. The day we saw it, we had 12 Jaguar encounters with seven different cats. Can you believe that? It's just incredible. This was the first one we saw, big giant male. Made possible because of the beautiful soft light, right? If this was sun, that background would be full of highlights and shadows, it would be a mess. We want this nice, quiet, soft light when we're working in jungles, working in forests, places like that. So it cuts that contrast down and makes, makes, uh, makes everything within the tonal range that our cameras can handle. From Kenya uh, on Lake Bagora, Bagoria, a uh, flock of lesser flamingos, again, made possible by the nice, soft, quiet light. You can imagine if the sun were on this, this would be just ripped with highlights and shadows. It would just be a mess. We need that quiet, soft light. Using a long lens, you know, I could get a lot closer to this and shoot this with like an 80 to 200, but I actually counterintuitively backed up, used a 600 millimeter lens because excuse me, long telephotos have the, the, uh, uh, the, where they compress things and really visually stack all these things up. So by using a 600 millimeter lens and compressing everything, I've really uh, accentuated the number of, of flamingos in here. 
Okay. Oh, I got this picture in there twice. So you make a note of that too, Apaticus, baby. Um, thank you. Uh, so macro photography, we really want it. The macro photography, little scenes like this, all about the details. Nice, quiet, soft light. This is a weird flower here in Michigan called the uh, round lobe tabatica. I don't know if you have these out west, but they only open on sunny spring days. So, but we need clouds to, to be able to photograph this. So I actually bring a big four foot diffuser and just, I call it my own portable cloud. So I let it open up and then come over and diffuse it and make the picture. But you, we, we need this quiet, soft light to bring out all these beautiful details. <clears throat> Okay, next favorite kind of light is warm light. Back when I shot film, like when I used to shoot Kodachrome, that was the only light that film ever looked good in was warm light. You could shoot it for like an hour in the morning, an hour in the evening. The rest of the time, it looked terrible. So warm light, obviously, low low angle sun. This, is, this picture's a picture of light, right? There's just a deer in the way. It's all about that beautiful warm light, right? Okay, Bosque Delapache, the uh, the sandhill cranes taken off in the morning. They do this every morning from the flight pond. Nice, beautiful, warm light. One of the things I like about warm light is, well, it's warm, but it also imparts sort of a time stamp, right? You can tell that this was early in the morning or late in the evening, right? Okay, beautiful warm light. This was just a weird spotlight effect where the clouds opened up for just a second and just lit that one stand of trees there. But that beautiful warm, the beautiful warm light on those beautiful warm trees against the cool mountain just pops that whole thing and, and makes that whole whole scene pop. All right, just special, special lighting. All right, and then we have the edges of light, right? What are the edges of light? Well, think about just before or just after the sun comes up or just before or after the sun goes down. Um, the sun is out of the sky and the sky becomes a pink purple kind of a magenta color. Well, that is the color cast of, of that light, right? Because the sky, the pink purple magenta sky becomes your light source. So those pictures are going to have a very pink magenta color cast to them. This, of course, is Horseshoe Bend. Um, now, of course, with uh, post-processing, we can adjust and fine-tune that color cast to, to whatever we want. But if we've done, if we've made the picture in that sort of light, the, the final print or the final image should have that color cast to it. Right? Again, quiet, soft light. Nicole and I love getting out. One of the one of the great things about living here in Michigan is we have dewy mornings in August. It's just amazing to get out there and find these little. This is a uh, an eastern tailed blue. He's about the size of your thumbnail, just a little teeny tiny guy. But it's all about the details. We need this quiet, soft light to let all these details through, right? If the sun were on here, there'd be too much contrast. It wouldn't work at all. So once the sun hits our subject, once the sun comes up too high, we're pretty much done shooting. Okay, fog is another edge type of light. This is uh, from our Kenya trip. This was, was this in Brewer, I think? Um, beautiful rhinos, but look at this, how, what the fog does to this, just that mist. If, if that mist wasn't there, those trees would be dark, black, giant distractions. You know, I'd still take the picture because it's pretty cool, but with the fog, it just makes it magical, right? And it just softens that and it adds a beautiful sense of place and beautiful atmosphere to it. All right, bad news. There is also bad light. All right, we'll co cover a couple of the bad lights. Dumpy light, All right? This is dumpy light. This is a dumpy subject on dumpy water and dumpy light, right? There's just, there's no color to it. There's no, there's no depth to it. It's just flat and lifeless. Now, if this were a cardinal on a pine bough, we could probably bring something out of it, but a dumpy subject like this and cruddy light like this is just, there's nothing you can do to really pull it out. It's just gonna be a dumpy picture. The other side of that coin, we've got harsh light. This is a tyrant tyrannulate feeding its, its, uh, its mate. 
on the equator at noon. Right. I had to really dig to find something in this crappy light because usually I throw these away, but it's really bad light, super harsh, way more contrast. It's just not pleasing, pleasant light. Generally in light like this, I'm scouting, looking for other things to photograph. All right. Then the last little bit of bad light can be dappled light, right? We talked about uh, doing jungles and forest scenes and things like that. The light on the left, this isn't terrible but I much prefer the light on the right where everything's evenly illuminated and the light doesn't become a distraction to the scene. To my eye, the picture on the left, that light and all of that bright and shadows and all of that just detracts from the overall scene of the picture. So usually I'm looking for a nice quiet soft light for things like this, <clears throat> excuse me. Okay, we are still making decisions. Is there nothing you need to interrupt me for? Nicole, are you still there? I think these can hold. I think okay. it's going to be good. Yeah. All right, I'm just surprised you're not falling asleep. No, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm making mental notes of things. That was, was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, by the way, not your high school teacher. Oh, was that Ruth Cobart. Bader Ginsburg? Yeah. Oh, it, it looked like Sister Jean Lenore. Oh. <laughs> see, I, see, I'm going to get a lot of notes when I'm done. <laughs> That's funny. That's a little awkward. They're, they're, they're. All right. So we are still, we can, we can deal with all that stuff later. Sorry, guys. All right. So the next thing, we're still making decisions. So the next thing, we're going to decide our perspective from where we're going to make our picture. All right. So. Beautiful Sally Lightfoot crab. This is how everybody photographs them, right? They put in the effort to get down on their knees and, and get their tripod maybe three feet off the ground. It's okay, but look at this, right? You want this or this, right? Laying down in the mud right up on top of them. Put the viewer right eye level with your subject it's going to pay a lot of dividends, right? This is way, way, way more impactful as far as I'm concerned, right? And I literally got my, my camera balanced on a rock or, or tripod legs all splayed out, getting just as low as I can possibly get, <clears throat> right? Snowy owl, same thing. The only way to get a snowy owl looking down at you is to be laying down on the ground next to him, all right? So number one, Obviously, this is way more intimate. We've put the viewer right in the snowy owl's world, right? We put them right eye to eye. But for this picture in particular, even more important for me, look what it does to the background, right? If we were standing up or even, you know, kneeling down, that white would creep up more and we would have a white background. One of the things I love about this and one of the reasons I got down as low as I could is I wanted to get that dark background to make that bird excuse me, pop off of that background, right? So a lot of benefits for getting low, right? Super cute, right in the squirrel's world. I am literally eye to eye with this, with this little chipmunk, right? And the difference between six inches off the ground and four inches off the ground is surprisingly big, right? Get as low as you can possibly get. So this is made, uh, Nicole and I built a, uh, a uh, reflecting pool blind, a ground blind where the ground is recessed into the, into the earth. We've got a YouTube channel. We'll put a link in, our, in the notes, but we'll show you how to build this. This is the coolest blind ever. Those bluebirds in the front with the beginning with the reflections, that was there. Lots of cool stuff coming out of that blind. We got a great YouTube channel, lots of good stuff. <clears throat> All right, landscapes, same thing put the viewer my goal with landscapes often many many times is to put the viewer as if they were sitting on a mossy boulder right next to this stream right we've got a nice foreground a midground a background i love the way the shape of the violets is echoed in the in the waterfall right i am right on top of those violets this is probably again a maybe a, a 12 millimeter lens i'm maybe 10 inches away from those violets right? Depth of field was a real challenge. I, I didn't focus stack this. I was able to do it in one shot, but 
I made sure everything was sharp before I tore things down, right? I, I focused about a third of the way into the picture because a third of your depth of field is in front of where you focus and two thirds is behind. So I focused about a third of the way in. Then I zoomed in and I checked to make sure this moss down here was sharp and all of the stuff was up here was sharp. And then I took my tripod down and went on and made the next picture. That's the beauty of the screen on the back of the camera. Not only to check your histogram, but to double check your composition and double check to make sure all the bits you want sharp or sharp, right? So take advantage of that, especially a situation like this, nothing's moving, nothing's changing. All right, a lot of people would just focus stack that. I'm lazy, I just wanna do it in one shot and not have to deal with it later. Okay, talking about perspective, um, not only low, from for this picture, I wanted I specifically wanted to photograph the top of the blooper of the bluebird because that's where the pretty part is, right? So I'm actually up on a scaffold 15 feet above this guy, shooting down on, on top of it, getting a unique and different perspective. All right. Now we're gonna start setting up our camera. Everybody gets all crazy. Oh my gosh f-stops and shutter speeds and iso and oh my gosh how do i how do i make a decision what do i do so many dials and numbers and buttons and things well i always come whenever i start a situation i always come into a situation and i say okay what's most important here is my depth of field is my f-stop is my depth of field an important consideration for instance in a landscape or a macro photograph or something like that is there a reason i need to prioritize my depth of field or is there a reason i need to photograph or, or prioritize my shutter speed right and almost always think about all the different situations usually one of those two things is the priority and we, we figure that priority out and that's where we start so Let's look at some situations where we're going to prioritize our depth of field, our zone of sharpness. All right, here's a, uh, a uh, what is that, a bighorn sheep He's sitting up on Mount Killa Photographer out in Yellowstone, chewing his cud. As he's sitting there, behind him are a bunch of sagebrush and rocks and boulders and things like that that I don't want to become visual distractions. So I'm trying to control my background. I want to get enough depth of field where he's sharp and his horn is sharp and his face is sharp and some of this grass in front of him is sharp, but I don't want to stop down so much that I get all of that those visual distractions cluttering up my background, right? So I'm going to shoot this about F8 or so. And then I'm going to double check. I'm going to look and see, make sure the things I want sharp and make sure that that stuff in the background isn't coming into, in, into focus, right? Because we can't just focus, stop all the way down to F11 or F16, although we could because he's just sitting there, but that would screw up our background. And then again, once we take it, we're going to double check, right? He's sitting there chewing his cut. He's not going anywhere. We're going to zoom in. We're going to look at his face. We're going to look at the horns. We're going to check the background and make sure that those rocks and things aren't coming into a distraction. But our depth of field was our priority. All right. Other situation here, I'm trying to isolate this subject. What's going on here is I'm photographing through orange leaves that are in front of the owl and there's yellow leaves behind the owl. And my vision here was to just completely isolate this subject and little out of focus blobs of color, right? So I'm shooting this completely wide open. This is probably a 2.8 with a 300 millimeter 2.8. So the only thing sharp is his face because I wanted, excuse me, all of those leaves to just become out of focus blobs. So my priority was minimal depth of field, right? I wanted to isolate it with a very narrow depth of field. All right, we talked about macro photography a little bit. Photography's little uh, challenge is, this cruel challenge is that when we get, the closer we get to things, the less depth of field we have. So whenever we're doing macro photography, we're always working to get a lot of depth of field. All right. This is a, a Baltimore checker spot on a clover. Um, and 
This is probably at F-16 or F-22. We go out early in the morning here in Michigan when the temperature is below 60 degrees. So this butterfly is in a state of torpor. They're cold-blooded. He can't move until he warms up. There's no wind. We're on a tripod. So this very well might be a six, four, six, eight, 10 second exposure, right? F-16, F-22, our shutter speed doesn't matter at all because nothing's moving, we're using a cable release, but we need to get enough depth of field to keep everything sharp, all right? So our depth of field is our priority. All right, landscape photographs. Many times when we're doing landscapes, we want to keep sharpness through the image to give the viewer the feeling that they're standing right here at this beautiful overlook. So it needs to be sharp from their toes all the way out to, to infinity, right? So we're stopped way down, shooting a long shutter speed, maybe a two or four second exposure. Lots of depth of field. All right, let's look at some situations where we're gonna have a priority on our shutter speed. Okay, where our first consideration is gonna be our shutter speed. Okay, obviously flight photography, All right? Any kind of action photography, where if we're trying to freeze the action, we've gotta get a fast enough shutter speed to freeze that action, okay? And as I mentioned earlier, I'm shooting an aperture priority but I'm not watching the aperture, I'm watching my shutter speed, right? For a shot like this, I'm gonna be a 750 to a thousandth of a second minimum, right? That's gonna be my starting point to get a fast enough shutter speed to stop this. And even though I'm doing aperture priority, I'm prioritizing my shutter speed. Okay, we can also handle motion in a more painterly way right? We can drag the shutter and shoot what I call a motion blur, right? This is probably about a 15th or a 20th of a second. I'm panning with the elk as he's running and, and just firing off frames <laughs> as he's running, hoping to get one where his face is relatively sharp, sharp enough to carry the picture and everything else goes blurry. His feet almost disappear because they're the fastest moving thing. The background and the, and the field is all blurred because I'm, I'm panning with the subject. If I were to just sit stationary and fire when he came into the frame, the background and everything would be sharper, but because I'm panning, everything goes blurry and his face, I'm shooting. And, you know, typically these are just kind of, these are fun experiments, right? I'm just playing here. The lights, there's not a lot of light. He's running around. I'm going to try to do some of this stuff. And I'm probably going to throw away 80% of it because maybe his face isn't sharp or it just didn't look right. So, but it's something fun to do when, when there's not a lot of light. And typically, you know, for, for big, bigger mammals, anywhere from a 15th to a 30th of a second usually works pretty good, depending on how fast they're going. Birds, you know, you're going to want to be 120, 1, 125th or 160, 160th in that area. So, but it's an experiment, just play. Okay. And then, of course, we've got the beautiful milky, or the beautiful, maybe you need to make another note, milkly, the milkly water. I, I didn't have her spell check me. Yeah, I should have um, checked this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so milky water, right? We're dragging our shutter. This is probably a four or an eight second exposure, really long exposure to allow that water to paint itself across the uh, across the frame. Okay, the the white comes from the air bubbles in the water, just painting themselves across the frame. Super easy and fun to do. Quick tip, polarizer. I always use a polarizer on this that, that takes the reflections off the, or lessens the reflections on the water, make the water darker and that milky water uh, show up more. Uh, polarizers too for fall, fall color. A lot of people don't think about it, but polarizers remove reflections, right? All leaves have a waxy coating on them and that will reflect the sky. So if you use a polarizer, that will remove that reflection and let more color in. So something fun, to, good tip to have there for fall color. All right, but this is milky water. Our shutter speed is our priority because we want to get a slow enough shutter speed to, to blur the water. All righty, let's review. 
So we make, we're making a bunch of decisions, right? So did we decide what caught our eye, right? What do we want to communicate about it? Because that's the power of photography. We can communicate things, is it? And it can be just something, look how pretty this is, but make sure you, you, you're photographing just the pretty parts, right? Whether you're going to do a vertical or horizontal or both, how are you going to put the elements together in the picture? Think about the rule of thirds. Think about foreground and background and midground. <clears throat> think about how to put everything together to make a pleasing composition. How are we going to use the light? Is it good light? Is it bad light? Do we want front light, side light, back light? All right? Is it, is it warm light? Are we using the light to the best advantage? All right? From where are we going to take our picture? Right, we're setting up our exposure. Are we going to prioritize? Is our depth of field prioritize priority, or is our our shutter speed a priority? And then your moment. We didn't talk about the moment a lot, but you know, there's that decisive moment. So many times, I'm sitting there with my with my hand on my camera, just waiting for just that instant to to fire the the camera and get the right moment, or I'm I'm laying on the 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 uh the shutter taking 10 frames a second open to get that moment all right once we got all this stuff done we make the picture all right now the time to do all this stuff is before you get to your subject okay what i mean is if i see a bird out there that i'm going to want to photograph and I got to walk a little ways to get it out there. I'm not going to walk down there. I'm not going to set my tripod down and start working on all this stuff. As I'm walking out there, I'm looking back. I'm going to see where the sun is. I'm going to see, do I want to wait for a cloud to come over so I get better light? Am I, is the, the light where I want it? Am I going to line myself up differently? I'm looking at the background, trying to think, okay, if I shoot over here, I'm going to have that as a background. If I shoot over here, there's going to be this stick in the background, right? I'm looking at all that stuff. I'm thinking about from what height I want to make the picture. I'm adjusting my tripod legs i'm setting up my exposure i'm thinking about you know do i want to prioritize depth of field or shutter speed what's my intent there so hopefully when i get to where i can start shooting i can set my camera down and start shooting right and then once i take a picture i'm going to make that first picture and then i'm going to look and i'm going to say okay what can i do to make it better i'm going to continue to refine and tweak the picture till i as long as the subject will let me until i can get the best picture i can make there i'm going to look to see if i can change my perspective i'm going to look and see maybe this cloud will come over and give me a little bit different light i'm going to look and see if maybe i can move five feet over and get a completely different background right i'm going to work the subject right? Last thing I want to talk about is this, working the subject, right? We spend so much time thinking about photography. We spent so much money on gear. We traveled around the world. We, you know, we think about photography, we, we're reading books, we're watching YouTube videos, we're, we're thinking about subjects, all the uh, photography all the time. Then we get out in the field and we've got a perfectly good subject in front of us. And doggone it, there's something better over the hill, right? Don't fall into that trap. When you've got a perfectly good subject in front of you, take all the pictures you can because there may not be something over that hill, right? So when you've got a good subject, work it. Keep making pictures. Take all the pictures you can before you move on to the next thing. Don't just take one picture and be done with it. Take all the pictures you can. Here's a, a real quick example. This is a Promethea moth. Pretty cool moth. First picture I took, pretty standard picture. Put him up on a log, took his picture. Beautiful moth, about the size of your hand. All right, here I grabbed a different lens. This is a, uh, a new lens that Nicole and I are playing with. This is uh, the Leowa 15 millimeter wide angle lens. It's a really fun lens. It allows you to put macro subjects in habitat, which is just a fun and unique and different, different view, different, something fun to play with. Kind of a challenge to use, but, but it makes some cool and unique images. Moved in tight, did just those cool antennas of this male. Males had the big plumy antennas. And then of course, those beautiful eye spots. 
right? Now, is any of these pictures better than any of the other ones? Probably not. I mean, but they're all different, right? I took, and this is probably just a handful of the pictures I took that day, but I took all the pictures I could think, right? Work the subject, continue to refine it and find all the pictures you can. That is the show. Oh, here's the best trip of all. This is the best tip of all. Come on a trip with Steve and Nicole. We've got, we just put up our 2022 schedule. We got a bunch of stuff. Um, there's, uh, here's our website. You can go there and check everything out. Um, we've got a Facebook page, lots of great stuff on Facebook. We're posting a lot on Facebook, all of our Facebook uh, images. It's Steve Gettle nature photography. They've all, we've got all the technical data on how, how each picture, if you like to see what shutter speed and F stop and ISO and all of those things, it's on every single picture we ever post. There's a lot of good tips on there. We just started a YouTube channel. We'll put all that stuff in, uh, in the notes for you guys. We also, we just did a, a, a ebook on how to do silhouettes. We'll, we'll put a link in there where you put a link in the notes. So we'll give that to you guys too. It's a, it's a great ebook, tell you how to do those really fun and creative images. So now let's delve into some questions. Yes, and there are quite a few. So um, I will just jump right in. Um, the first is from Susan. Is your flash on or off camera? And is your camera use, usually handheld or on a tripod? That's a great question. Uh, camera is always on a tripod. Nicole and I are, are kind of tripod Nazis. Um, a tripod is absolutely a pain in the butt. It gets in the way sometimes, and it has, in fact, cost me a picture or two in my life. But it's an absolutely necessary piece of equipment for us. For a lot of reasons. One, we shoot big giant lenses. You know, you can't handhold those for very long. We do a lot of different types of photography, like landscape photography, where we want to, where we're shooting slower shutter speeds, macro photography. So a tripod's uh, an important piece of equipment. Flash is uh, on a bracket. It's not in the hot shoe. It's on a bracket attached to the lens foot or the, the tripod head. And the reason for that is if you're shooting birds, if you have the flash in the hot shoe, you're going to get uh, uh, steely eye, which is the bird version of red eye. So, and also we have a, a, a extender, a, a Fresnel lens on the front element of the flash that projects it, turns the flash into a telephoto flash. That's called a better beamer or a mag mod, M-A-G-M-O-D. Okay, another question kind of came up a couple times. Um, Jim and then also uh, Ling Guo asked about ISO. Do you ever control shutter speed when with ISO when shooting an aperture priority rather than changing your aperture? And do you shoot with F ISO? Um, auto ISO. Sure. Yep. Yeah, good. Very good questions. I can tell you guys are good shooters. You got good questions yeah. out there. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> my default is to shoot the lowest ISO I can, right? So I always want to shoot. If I can shoot ISO 200, I will shoot ISO 200. If I can accomplish what I want to shoot and shoot ISO 200, that's what I will shoot. <clears throat> if I have to go up to ISO 1600 or 2000, I will do that. I, I don't, think too very often I've gone above ISO 2000. Uh, will I control the shutter speed with the ISO? Yes. If I'm, if I'm all the way open at F4 and I'm not getting a fast enough shutter speed, absolutely. That will be the next button I go to is, is to up my ISO to get a faster shutter speed. Shooting uh, auto ISO, I, I don't generally do that. That's a perfectly genuine or perfectly fine way to skin the cat. Um, the only cautionary tale I would tell you is if you do shoot with auto ISO, make sure you set a high limit because we've had so many people come in from a great day of shooting and they didn't realize they had their, their auto ISO had kicked all the way up to 25,000 or something crazy like that. So you can set a high limit that your camera will not go above. So make sure you do that. Mm -hmm. Um, a question that was from cheating. That was actually three questions. It was, I know <laughs> that was a bunch in there. Um, springboarding from your comments about the owl, how should we adjust the rules of composition if we shoot stock photography versus images for nature com competitions at the club? 
So camera clubs, I, I first off, camera clubs are awesome. I love camera clubs. I, I, I came up through camera clubs. Camera clubs have made me the photographer I am today. Honest to God, they're just, they're great places to learn. You don't become a great photographer until you start getting critical feedback on, on your work. You know, if you show your work to your parents and your friends and, and brothers and sisters, they're all going to tell you great things. But until you get in, get real critical feedback, that's when you really start to grow. Camera clubs are great for networking, for finding out about equipment, for places to shoot, things like that. Camera clubs kind of... of train you to for, to pack the frame, shoot things real tight, really clean. And that's where my style comes from. Clean, simple, elegant images, because that's what does well in camera clubs. But if you want to shoot for the editorial market, packed in the frame, full frame, edge to edge pictures, they're hard. They got to jam those into certain places in the magazine, right? They don't always work. So for editorial stuff, you want to shoot a little bit looser. My agent is always telling me to back off, right? Because, but I still, you know, I shot slides and you got what you got. So I, I, my final image is often my final image. I am working very hard to try to shoot both, right? Because I still like that full frame camera club type image, but I do force myself to back off and shoot a little looser for editorial. That's a great question. Okay. Bob is asking, how do you have time to make these decisions with wildlife that may be gone in, in an instant? You know, you wouldn't know it to look at me, but I'm really smart and I process things super fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I, you know, it, it's not, look, there are fleeting things that happen and you just, you know, a lot of times it's reflexive. You, Nicole and I are super lucky in that we have our cameras in our hands virtually every single day. I know instinctively which way to turn the, the zoom ring. I know which way to turn to stop down or open up, you know, so we can make those decisions fast, quickly, and we do it instinctively. But that, you know, usually... The best stuff doesn't happen fleetingly, right? When I get when when we get the best images, it's when you've you've earned the 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 subject's trust and had them take you into their into their allow you into their world. I tell people I get my best images when I have to back up, right? It's part of it is is just earning their trust and being able to spend time because the more time you spend with your subject the more behaviors, the more backgrounds, the more different situations you're going to get. So those fleeting things happen and you got to be ready when they do, but hopefully that's not all the time. Right. So. Okay. This one kind of goes off of that same subject. It's from Ed. He's asking for the animal shots, like the crab, owl, squirrel, which I think he meant chipmunk. How far chipmunk, away yeah. uh, from the subject and how do you avoid frightening the animal away while you're making all the necessary decisions? What focal length um, are you using for these? So, uh, oh, it's, it's a lot of different techniques, right? Sally Lightfoot crab, they're pretty tame. You just slowly work into it. You know, I mean, literally it's getting down and then sometimes it's belly crawling that last four feet to get really close and tight. Cause that was with a 200 millimeter macro. So I was pretty close to that thing, but it's a crab. It's not, you know, and it's just slowly working your way in. So it might, you know, you might invest a little more time to be able to get that close, but in the end it pays a lot of dividends. Um, we work in blinds a lot. Right. So, so like the chipmunk that was in our ground blind, right. We, we, uh, uh, and then, and then the other thing is like, like the loons are a good example. I spent years, like eight or nine years photographing the same pair of loons on a lake up in Northern Michigan. And when I first went on the lake, they wouldn't let me within a hundred yards of them. But I went in my and I just sat in my boat and read a book and, and got them to accept me. And after a couple of years of doing that, they accepted me and my boat till I was just like a log. Like they would, they just completely ignored me. If another boat came too close, they would take off like they were shot. But they knew that I was so part of it is is earning that trust with the with the subjects. Okay. Kent is asking, if you want to have a blurred background, do you find that most of your photos are taken with a fast prime lens? 
Um, well, so it's easier to control the background with a bigger lens. Um, so, and for birds, you know, you're, I'm generally shooting with my 600 millimeter lens, unless I'm in a blind, like our bird, if you go to our YouTube channel, we just put up a video on how we do backyard birds, which is super easy, super accessible. Um, and it's just putting some forethought into where you're gonna set up your bird feeder and, and how the backgrounds and how the lights are all going to work. But you put some thought into something like that. And, and then it's, it's, you know, I generally shoot more stop down than most people. Another reason I shoot off of a tripod because I shoot birds at one, one twenty-fifth at F 10, F 11, F 14 all the time, because I want to get not just their eye sharp. I want to get, enough of the bird sharp so you can really see the detail. And I put myself in situations where the background is far enough away that I can do that. And sometimes I can't, sometimes I have to open up the F8 or so to, to get the background. So it's, it's more situational awareness. You would be surprised if you put more thought into the background, how often you can really control it, right? So it's just a matter of, of being in the right headspace and thinking about it and considering it. Okay, Irina's asking when I photograph a flying bird, do I have to turn the image stabilization off? You need to, to look at your at your lens manual. Certain lenses <clears throat> like uh, like you know, all the Nikons that's 200 to 400 to 600 f4, those the image stabilization, those big lenses, they realize you're probably not gonna be hand holding them. So the image stabilization is supposed to work on the tripod. Um, like the 150 to 600. Sigma, I think it's supposed to be off, but I've had people that have tested it and they say it works fine if it's on. Because if you're moving with a subject, even if you're on a tripod, if you're shooting a moving subject, you're still kind of hand holding because your tripod's going to be loose. Now, if you lock your camera down, sometimes you should you should turn it off. But if you're shooting a moving subject, you're more often better off keeping the image stabilization off. Okay, Eric's asking, assuming snowflake shots must be temperature dependent, is there a best or required temperature to get the shot before the flake melts? Um, well, it's more, the temperature is, has more to do with uh, getting a good quality snowflake, right? Because if there's too much humidity or it's not quite cold enough, you'll get rime ice on them. Um, but it's obviously, it's gotta be below freezing. Um, we can, we'll put a you link. You want to point them to the, yeah. Yeah. We've I'll, got I'll a blog a, post on it. Yeah. We've got a blog post on how we did the snowflakes. So that was a cool project. Um, and I'll tell you exactly how we did it. Yeah. All right. We have eight more questions just so you know. Go ahead. Um, Forrest is asking, how do you set up fill flash for birds? And this is Forrest from our Bosky trip. Oh, for, hey, Forrest. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, great guy. Um, so it, it's actually, people get really intimidated by fill flash. So a couple things that the key things to remember, I spoke about getting it off the hot shoe, right? That's, that's number one, get a bracket. So it gets up uh, and it doesn't have to get up hard, just two or three inches off the hot shoe. You need to get either a, uh, some kind of Fresnel lens, a better beamer or a Magmod, M-A-G-M-O-D. Those are two little Fresnel lens that act as a telephoto that will project the flash out far enough. And then it's just a matter of, let's see, uh, I set my flashes to minus one and two thirds and that's a, a flash compensation. And what that does is it just sends out a little burst of light because you want your flash to be subtle. You just want to fill in the shadows and bring out the colors. Minus one and two thirds. And I literally set that and forget it. And then you want to make sure that in your camera, your flash, your uh, your sync speed is at high speed sync, meaning that the that just ensures that your flash fires while the shutter's open. Okay, um, another question, an anonymous question. How often do you crop your nature images? When you crop, do you keep the original aspect ratio? Um, you know, again, and this is a bad habit. I generally don't crop a lot and it's just, it's because I shot slide film for so long and you got what you got. And 
I can't, I have to, my agent wants 50 meg TIFFs. So I don't like to up res things too much. So I generally don't crop. We have big giant lenses. I use crop cameras. I use teleconverters. I don't often crop, you know, like if you look at, on our Facebook page, we tell you when I, when I crop, I, I'll actually tell you when I crop, if I crop to 10% or 20%, I will put that on there. But generally we try not to crop a whole lot just because it, it degrades the image. So I can't send it to my, to my agent. That's not as useful for him. Okay. Another anonymous question. If you don't get the diffused cloudy light, do you ever use an umbrella or a diffusion cloth, especially for low macro work? Yep. Absolutely. Like those hepaticas, we were talking about those little purple flowers. That's a flower that only opens when it's sunny because it needs the warmth to open up and it needs soft light. So I have a big four foot diffuser that one of those, what are those things called that they collapse and they open? Oh, it's just a diffuser. Yeah, but it's a four foot. There's a name for them. Photo, oh, photo disc. Oh, photo yeah, disc. yeah. Yeah, the photo yeah. disc diffusers. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, another question from Anonymous. Do you use a macro or telephoto lens for the close-up butterfly shots? So that the 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 macro stuff is all done with a macro lens. And and uh we use a, a 105 and a 200 macro. Uh, I like the 200 macro a lot, especially on a full frame camera, on a crop camera, the 105, because the 200 gets too much on the crop camera. But it is, they are dedicated macro, macro lenses. And that we love, love, love doing macro photography. Macro photography is so fun because it's so accessible, right? You don't have to travel around the world. You don't have to have tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear. You can just go out in a meadow by your house and find insects and butterflies and things like that to photograph. So it's it's really easy and accessible kind of photography. And the other thing about macro photography is it teaches you how to be a better technician, right? Photography is a weird art form in that we've got to have the the, the artistry of, of light and composition and patterns and texture and all of that stuff. But we also have to be good technicians, right? We have to be able to manage depth of field and shutter speed and do all that stuff. And macro really teaches you how to do that. That's one of the best things about macro photography. I will oh, throw I, in I, one quick question so that you can kind of continue on that. Oh, okay. uh, Barbara's asking, when the wings of butterflies are quite wet, can they fly? No, and that's one of the secrets to our macro photography is we go out, well, I don't know if they probably could fly if they had to, but they're reticent to fly. How about we put it that way? So one of the things that we love about the macro photography here in Michigan is we get a lot of uh, late summer, early fall, late spring uh, days when it gets below 60 degrees, we get really good dew formation. And when it's below 60, insects are cold blooded, so they can't move until they warm up. And that's one of the secrets to all of this. Get out there before the sun comes up, when it's cool enough that the insects are, are ready and willing subjects and, and, uh, and it's, it's really easy to do. We, yeah. I, I kind of went off on macro photography. because I, I know, I was trying to rein you in. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we have three more questions. Go ahead. Um, Poonam is asking, I'm guessing it may take several attempts to get the right light, right background, et cetera. Do you spend several days at a location to make sure this happens? In a perfect world, I, you know, I mean, we travel a lot. We go back to the same locations. You know, we're doing photo tours to the same location. That's one of the reasons you should come with us because we know the locations, we know when to be there, where to go for when <clears throat> for the right light and for, you know, so, you know, we're lucky that we get to go back to these locations time and time again, but you know, it's, it's, it, it there is something to be in at the right place at the right time. So the more you're there, the more often you're going to get lucky like that shot of, uh, of the oxbow and the Tetons with the beautiful yellow light on those trees. I've been there a hundred times. We, you know, we got those conditions once where those trees lit up like that, so. Okay, Adele is asking, how do you determine which photos to throw out? I don't throw any of my photos out, <laughs> Adele. What are you talking about? <laughs> No, I, I'm very mercenary about the images I keep. We shoot a lot. I process everything I keep. And 
if I'm not going to send it to my agent, if I don't want to see it in a magazine or someplace with my name under it, if I'm, then I'm going to throw it out. If it's of no use to me, I, I throw it out. And I do that mercilessly because we shoot a lot and I have a lot of images and I don't need a bunch of junk that I don't want. I don't, I'm not emotionally attached. You know, if I, when I get a picture, you know, something crazy like a wild wolf, even if it's a bad picture, I might keep that for a sentimental reasons, but that's very, very rare. So, all yeah, right. That's... And our last question, an anonymous attendee asked, what kind of tripod head do you use? So we use a couple different, well, we use a few different tripod heads. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so um, we are sponsored by Pro Media Gear, which is a company out of Chicago that makes great tripods and they make a, a gimbal style head called uh, a Katana Junior. It's really nice. We use that for birds and, and for any kind of action photography for all kinds of long lenses. Um, and then we use, I use their 34 L or no 344 L tripod, which is a great carbon fiber tripod. Highly recommend those. I've used Wimberly um, for their gimbal heads and then ball heads. We use, oh, the really right stuff, BH 55. Yep. The, yeah, the BH55 That's really the right one. stuff stuff head. We also use the Wimberly Sidekick for smaller gimbal type. And then I use uh, for macro photography, for really extreme macro photography, we use a Bogan. It's a geared head for, for doing the macro photography. And that just allows us to move uh, the... Uh, the camera on one axis. And when you're in really tight, that's super handy. Nicole and I have been promising that we're going to do an ebook on tripods, gimbal heads, ball heads, camera plates, lens plates, all of that stuff. We're, we've been kind of working around the edges. We got kind of a rough draft done. We're going to be putting that out soon. If you guys get on our ebook list for our silhouettes, our book, we'll make sure yeah, you know, or on our email list. Yeah. So yeah. we'll just provide that to everybody. But, uh, but that's a really complicated subject, but that's what we use. Yeah. All right. That's our questions. Okay. Awesome. Well, those were good questions. I, I always yeah. tell Nicole, we can always tell when we got good photographers out there by the quality of questions we get. So Jeffrey, thank you for pulling us together. A great audience. You're very welcome. It was really, really wonderful. Oh, you're nice. Thank you. Okay, and we will uh, we will get those notes out to you guys. We're probably gonna go to bed because it's it's like midnight here. So yeah. um, it's tomorrow here. <laughs> <laughs> so we will we will get the notes out to everybody tomorrow. And and thanks for everybody's attention and their great questions. Thank you. And thanks again, Jeffrey. All right. Good night, everybody. Oh, I'm still sharing. Oh, that was weird. I, I you should have told me to stop doing that. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs> Good night, everyone.